Hi everyone. So all of you who are new here, myself Dr. Simran Kaur. I'm a radiology resident and I'm an EC from G certified physician. I'm done with the USMLE steps and I'm here to teach you very important flashcards regarding the you know the INICT, the topics that have been repeated several times. So before starting the session, uh, I want you to tell uh, I want you you know guys to know about the uh, the packages that are available with an academy. So they have come up with the, the new courses and uh, this is aimed next on Neat PG. So you can get this for 21,000 and uh, the code that you can use to get the discount is med student. You can use my code med student. And there's a separate course that is being run by Dr. Zanip Bora. She's an excellent teacher. So you can go ahead with that too. So use my code med student to get the discount. Okay, so I'll wait for two more minutes so that everyone could join and then uh, subsequently we'll be begin the session. Hi, Gurjeet, how are you? Okay, so let us uh, begin the session. So if you can see on the screen, this is the flashcard number one. So it has been seen that these reflexes, then cranial nerves, okay, then extraocular muscles, the eye, these things, they are really, really important. So when you talk about this afferent and the efferent uh, limb for the gag reflex, what do you think would be the answer? So if the question involves this wording, afferent and the efferent limb for the gag reflex, what would you answer here? Anyone? Hi Ankit, good evening. So some of you are answering fifth nerve, okay. So you have to tell both the components, okay. So afferent as well as the efferent component. So guys, when you talk about the gag reflex, the afferent component that you have to keep in mind is the glossopharyngeal nerve, okay. And the efferent limb that you have to remember is the vagus nerve, that is the 10th cranial nerve. This is really important. Now the take home message is that you should also know about the other kind of reflexes. What is the afferent and what is the efferent limb there? Okay. So when you talk about the pupillary reflex, so if the question asks you what is the afferent component of the pupillary reflex or the efferent component of pupillary reflex, so what would you answer here? So when you talk about the afferent component of the pupillary reflex, your answer is going to be the optic nerve. When you talk about the efferent component, of the pupillary reflex, your answer is going to be oculomotor nerve. Now guys, this is the homework. Oculomotor nerve is really, really important. So please read about it. This is really important cranial nerve, all right? Then corneal reflex. So the afferent component of the corneal reflex is the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. That is the first division, all right? So now next question is that go home. Now, what you have to do is just read all you know about all these reflexes like uh, what is the efferent component of the corneal reflex so this is the question that you have to read once this class gets over i have uh, you know uh, intentionally not written it here so please read about it moving on so look at this question gag reflex usually is tested by touching dash pharyngeal wall so what do you think Gag reflex is usually tested by touching dash pharyngeal wall. So which pharyngeal wall would you touch to elicit a gag reflex? Anyone? Excellent, Smriti and Ankit, you give the right answer. The answer to this question is posterior pharyngeal wall. The answer to this question is posterior pharyngeal wall. And we have already talked about the apron and the efferent limb for the gag reflex. Now, what you have to remember regarding gag reflex, apart from the limbs, the afferent and the efferent, that you elicit, most commonly you elicit the gag, gag reflex by touching the posterior pharyngeal wall. All right. Now, moving on. So look at this question. Insulin stimulated glucose uptake by the skeletal muscle takes place by which glucose transporter? So what would you answer here? And the take home message from this flashcard is that you have to make a list of all the glucose transporters, GLUT1, 2, okay, and subsequently the others also. 
and you have to know the particular function carried out by them so what you have to remember is ki how insulin is able to push the glucose into the skeletal muscle with the help of which transporter so the answer yes gautam gurjeet you gave the right answer smriti and these are the right answers the answer is glut 4 okay so with the help of glucose transporter 4 insulin is able to push the glucose inside the skeletal muscle so insulin mediated uh, uptake of glucose by the skeletal muscle is equal to glut 4 now moving on so look at this question now maize contains excessive amount of something that inhibits the conversion of dash to niacin and hence leads to niacin deficiency so this is very important so you guys tell me that what does maize contain in excess and that substance is actually leading to niacin deficiency so what is the answer to this question anyone maize contains what in excess that would ultimately lead to niacin deficiency so first of all what you need to know is niacin is which vitamin niacin is which vitamin anyone niacin is which vitamin excellent that is vitamin b3 vitamin b3 okay now maize if someone is consuming diet that is rich in maize okay so maize if someone is consuming that in excess maize would contain something known as what would you answer here maize would contain something known as dash the answer to this question is leucin okay so maize contains excess of leucin now what leucin does is leucin inhibits the conversion of dash to dash so there is a very important concept here what is the precursor of niacin what is the precursor of niacin the answer to this question is that the precursor of niacin is tryptophan so we have tryptophan tryptophan is converted to niacin it is converted to niacin okay it requires a vitamin b6 as a cofactor it requires vitamin b6 as a cofactor now the leucine that is contained inside the maize okay that inhibits this conversion of tryptophan to niacin so if leucine is interfering in this step obviously the patient will land up having niacin deficiency or vitamin b3 deficiency now second question tryptophan would also be converted to dash here the answer is serotonin the answer is serotonin all right now this concept this reaction includes a lot of important concepts that i keep on repeating they are very very important so if someone is having tuberculosis and is on treatment the patient comes to you with signs and symptoms of pellagra so what is pellagra first of all pellagra is the condition that arises due to the deficiency of vitamin b3 or niacin this is the condition that arises due to the deficiency of niacin what are the signs and symptoms of pellagra the signs and symptoms of pellagra so we have diarrhea dermatitis dementia and there could be death of the patient also and there is a rash castle necklace rash on the sun exposed areas in the skin okay the most commonly involved dermatoma is c3 and c4 c3 and c4 now guys why do you think that the patient who is on uh, who is uh, undergoing treatment for tuberculosis would be getting pellagra what is the reason here can anyone answer this why do you think the patient who is having tuberculosis and is undergoing treatment would be having pellagra like symptoms what is the reason exactly simriti you gave the right answer so what happens is as you know that tuberculosis the first line management is hr ze okay we have isoniazid isoniazid then we have rifampicin then we have rifampicin then we have parazinamide parazinamide then we have 
it hamdrol it hamdrol these are the first line drugs for tb now if someone is consuming this isoniazid okay isoniazid is having a propensity to deplete the to deplete which vitamin levels your answer is vitamin b6 deplete the vitamin b6 levels okay b6 is pyridoxine pyridoxine so what you want to do in this situation what you expect here is that if someone is taking isoniazid b6 levels could reduce if b6 levels are reducing now come uh, go back to that uh, reaction again tryptophan tryptophan getting converted into the niacin getting converted into the niacin requires b6 as a cofactor now b6 is reduced b6 is getting depleted due to isoniazid treatment so this b6 is not going to be available as a cofactor for this reaction so ultimately niacin formation is going to suffer and the patient would end up having pellagra like symptoms pellagra like symptoms all right now there is one more important thing here so uh, another type of patient that could end up having uh, pellagra like symptoms for example uh, i'll tell you an example of a condition in which a child is having pellagra like symptoms pellagra like symptoms and later on later on it was found that there was a disorder in this child in which there was impaired absorption impaired absorption and reabsorption of tryptophan okay so absorption in the gut is impaired and reabsorption by the kidneys this is impaired of tryptophan okay so what is this situation that we are talking about so this has been asked in the previous years in names also okay so this is really very important for us that a child having pellagra like symptoms later on it has been found that this child is having a condition in which the intestinal absorption as well as the renal reabsorption of tryptophan is impaired what is this condition yes sachi you gave the right answer samriti yes this is heart nope disease okay so this is heart nope disease heart nope disease so condition in which the intestinal absorption of uh, the tryptophan as well as the renal reabsorption of tryptophan is impaired this is heart nope disease so guys what is going to happen if tryptophan is not getting absorbed or reabsorbed by the kidneys so it is not getting absorbed by the intestine and not getting reabsorbed by the kidneys so what is going to happen ultimately in this condition what are your thoughts about it yes if tryptophan is not you know getting absorbed by the intestine and not getting reabsorbed so overall the levels of tryptophan in the body are what will happen to the levels of tryptophan reduced because neither it is getting uh, absorbed properly nor it is getting uh, reabsorbed by the kidneys right so tryptophan is reduced if tryptophan tryptophan is less obviously we would have less of niacin because tryptophan was the precursor of niacin that is why the patients of heart nope disease also present with the signs and symptoms of pellagra the signs and symptoms of pellagra so this is a very important concept please keep this in mind all right okay coming to the next flash card here so please complete the table so this uh, flow chart is very high yield complete this table so guys whenever you come across few uh, flow charts for example uh, here we are talking about the catecholamine synthesis so these catecholamines they are really important so how would you complete this so number 1 the question is asking that which enzyme is responsible for the conversion of phenyl alanine to tyrosine so what would you answer here yes sachi you gave the right answer the answer to this question is phenyl alanine phenyl alanine hydroxylase 
hydroxylase. All right. Now, next step is the tyrosine getting converted into the dopa. Which enzyme is responsible for the conversion of tyrosine to dopa? What would you answer here? Tyrosine to dopa? The answer to this question, you will, you know, start the enzyme with tyrosine itself. So this is going to be tyrosine. Tyrosine hydroxylase. Hydroxylase. Okay, so phenylalanine to tyrosine with the help of phenylalanine hydroxylase. Now tyrosine to dopa with the help of the tyrosine hydroxylase. But dopa to dopamine. Dopa to dopamine. So which enzyme do you think would be converting dopa to dopamine? Yes. So what are your thoughts about it? Dopa to dopamine. The answer to this question is dopa. Yes, Samriti and Sachi. Yes, Arjun. That is the right answer. The answer is dopa decarboxylase. Dopa decarboxylase. This is the enzyme that converts dopa into the dopamine. All right. Next step. Which enzyme is responsible for the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine? Anyone? Which enzyme is responsible for the conversion of dopa to, sorry, dopamine to norepinephrine? Yes. The answer to this question is going to be dopamine. The answer to this question is dopamine beta monooxygenase. Dopamine beta monooxygenase. This is the enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine. All right. So let us talk a few more points about it. So this question is also asking that conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine. What is required here? Okay. Apart from this enzyme, there is also a requirement of something. What do you call it? The answer to this question is it requires. Yes. Can anyone answer to, uh, answer this question? What does it require? Your answer is vitamin C. Vitamin C. All right. So the conversion of dopamine to norepinephrine, this requires dopamine beta monoxygen and along with that it also requires vitamin C. So know this. Okay, so let us talk few more important points about the catecholamines. Okay, number one question. From where are catecholamines coming in the body? Who is making catecholamines? Who is making catecholamines? Anyone? Where are catecholamines made in the body? The answer to this question is adrenal medulla. Adrenal medulla. Okay. Now next question. Which type of cells in the adrenal medulla? Which type of cells in the adrenal medulla they are making catecholamines? Anyone? Which cells? Sachi, yes, you give the right answer. These cells, they are known as chromaffin cells. The chromaffin cells in the adrenal medulla, they make the catecholamines. Next question, who stimulates the catecholamine, uh, who stimulates the chromaffin cells to release the catecholamines? Who is stimulating these chromaffin cells? Anyone? Excellent, Gurjeet. The answer to this question is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine stimulates the chromaffin cells to release the catecholamines. Okay. Several times we have discussed this. What is the catecholamine secreting tumor of adrenal medulla? Catecholamine secreting tumor of adrenal medulla. What is the answer? Catecholamine secreting tumor of adrenal medulla. The answer to this question is pheochromocytoma. Excellent. Pheochromocytoma. All right. Now, what are the different examples of catecholamines? What are the different examples of catecholamines? We have epinephrine or epinephrine, dopamine. All right. So these are all the catecholamines. So know this. Moving on. Yes. So look at this flashcard. So condition in which there is problem in the intestinal absorption and renal reabsorption of tryptophan. Just now we talked about it. What do you think is the answer? 
condition in which there is problem in the intestinal absorption and the renal reabsorption of tryptophan. Anyone? Excellent. Yes, Smriti, Arjun, Sachi, Gurjeet, you give the right answer. The answer to this question is heart noob disease. Okay, heart noob disease. We have just now discussed about it. Okay, moving on. Which vitamin derivative is used for the management of acute promyelocytic leukemia? So this also you might have seen several times this has been repeated. So which vitamin derivative is used for the management of acute promyelocytic leukemia? Hmm? Excellent. So Smriti, Sachi, Gautam. No, Gautam, this is not vitamin B6 actually. Gurjeet, you gave the right answer. The answer to this question is vitamin A. Okay, so vitamin A derivative is used for the management of acute promyelocytic leukemia. Now, next question is which vitamin A derivative would you use for the management of acute promyelocytic leukemia? Which derivative of vitamin A would you use here? Yes. The answer to this question is ETRA. All trans retinoic acid. Okay. So know this vitamin A derivative that is all trans retinoic acid, you call it ETRA. That's, this is being used for the management of acute promyelocytic leukemia. All right. Okay. Uh, one quick question here. Vitamin A over supplementation. Vitamin A over supplementation could lead to a condition known as over supplementation guys. We are not talking about the deficiency of vitamin A. The answer to this question is pseudotumor cerebri. Pseudotumor cerebri. The other name of pseudotumor cerebri is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And in the previous unacademy lectures, I told you a few hints about pseudotumor cerebri. Young female, BMI more than 30, BMI more than 30, complaining of headache and visual, visual changes. Headache and visual changes. So this is the typical history of a patient who is having pseudotumor cerebri. And the management in this case is going to be estazolamide, which is carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Alright. Now, what is the ophthalmic finding? Uh, I showed you, I guess, in the previous lectures. So, uh, in the previous uh, years, they had shown this picture in the eye. And uh, there was some uh, soft tissue or uh, something coming in the eye that was uh, trying to cover the uh, iris. Okay. So remember regarding the bitted spots. Okay. So that is very, very important in case of vitamin A deficiency. Moving on to the next question. So in which condition would you expect a black pigment deposition in the intervertebral disc of the vertebra? And what would you call it? What would you call this black pigment deposition in the intervertebral disc of the vertebra? Excellent, Smriti. Yes, Sachi. The answer is ochronosis. Okay. Ochronosis. And in which condition would you expect it? In which condition would you expect it? Anyone? Excellent. Yes, Arjun. The answer to this question is number one, you will see this kind of problem in l -captonuria. This kind of situation would be seen in case of l -captonuria. Next, since we talk about the uh, this uh, pigment deposition in the intervertebral disc, this is known as a chronotic arthritis. Okay, sorry, not a, this is o chronotic arthritis. Okay. And in alkeptonuria, what you have to remember is that what is deficient in case of alkeptonuria. So this is also very high yield, guys. Remember, homogentesic acid oxidase, this is going to be deficient in case of alkeptonuria. So whenever they give you the hint of this uh, black pigment deposition and the, depo uh, and the deficiency of homogentesic acid oxidase, you're going to mark alkeptonuria. This is very high yield. Moving on. A typical uh, INICT pattern question. So match with the correct choice. So number one, you are given Ashraf body. Number two, steroid body. Then Anthony A and Anthony B bodies. And the last one is Paul Exner bodies. 
So all of these are very, very important. So let me see who is going to answer this correctly. Number one, ash of body. So ash of bodies are seen in which condition? Anyone? Ash of bodies are seen in which condition? Ash of bodies? The answer to this question is they are seen in rheumatic fever. Okay, they are seen in rheumatic fever. Asteroid bodies. Don't get confused. Asteroid bodies are seen in case of sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis. All right. Then Anthony A and Anthony B bodies are seen in case of schwannoma. Schwannoma. And the last one and the most high yield among them, collagenar bodies. Okay. Collagenar bodies. They are seen in case of granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. This is really very important. And yes, Smriti, you give the right answer. Okay. So, Asher body is rheumatic fever, asteroid body, sarcoidosis, Anthony and Anthony B bodies. They are seen in schwannoma. And call eczema body is in the granulosa cell tumor of the ovary. Okay. Now, let me ask you one more question here. What if the question mentions bilateral acoustic neuromas or bilateral schwannomas? Which syndrome would you mark here? Which syndrome would you mark here? Bilateral acoustic neuromas. Bilateral. Yes. So the answer to this question is NF2. NF2 stands for neurofibromatosis type 2. Okay. So remember this bilateral. Similarly guys, bilateral renal cell carcinoma. See, usually cancers are unilateral. But if you see these uh, situations, both decides. That means there's a high possibility that some kind of syndrome would be associated with them. Okay. Bilateral renal cell carcinoma. Most commonly associated with accident. This is VHL. Von Hippel Lindway syndrome. Okay. Which chromosome is associated with VHL? Chromosome number 3. Chromosome number 3. Which chromosome is associated with NF2? Which chromosome is associated with the, chromo uh, the NF2? NF2. The answer to this question is 22. 22. Okay. Which chromosome is associated with the NF1? So this is, this is the easy way to remember. NF1 is ending with 1. So you start the chromosome with 1. This is 17. NF2 is ending with 2. You start the chromosome with 2. That is 22. 22. Okay. So know about this. Okay. And what is the characteristic finding in case of neurofibromatosis type 1? What, do you, what would you see? Yes. NF1. What would you expect here? Can anyone answer this question? In neurofibromatosis type 1. So guys, mind it, neurocutaneous syndromes, they are very, very high yield. Be it Sturge Weber, tuberous sclerosis, or be it this uh, uh, neurofibromatosis, they are very, very important. Okay. So in NF1, we are talking about the multiple neurofibromas. Okay. And know about the cafe oil spots also. Because cafe oil spots, they could also be seen in a condition in which there is a young female who is coming to the OPD with precocious puberty. There's precocious puberty and she's also having polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. Okay. So let me write down that. So let me see who can answer this. Young female coming to the OPD with the unilateral cafe oil spots. Unilateral cafe oil spots. Along with that, she's having precocious puberty. Precocious puberty. Okay. Yes, Smriti. That is right answer. Gurjeet, right answer. This is McCune Albright syndrome. McCune Albright syndrome. Okay. There is polyostatic fibrous dysplasia also. Fibrous dysplasia. Okay, so it has been seen that the cafe oil spots are seen on the same side where there is fibrous dysplasia. Okay, so what you have to do is you, how would you differentiate the cafe oil spots seen in the neurofibromatosis from the cafe oil spots seen in the McCune Albright? How would you differentiate it? So the question is going to hint towards very important points. 
Okay, so if you compare the cafe olive spots in uh, neurofibromatosis and the macune albright, macune albright, so cafe olive spots, when you talk about the neurofibromatosis, they are going to have very smooth edges. They are going to have very smooth edges. Okay, whereas in the cafe olive spots in case of the macune albright syndrome, very irregular or rough edges irregular or rough edges and they are mostly seen on the same side as that of the fibrous dysplasia know about this condition moving on so this this uh, is very important point so although you won't be asked about it uh, directly you could be given a picture okay so this classical appearance crumpled tissue paper appearance of cells where do you see yes sachi smriti you give the right answer Swatantra, yes, that is Gorch's disease. Okay, so at least you should know this. This is really important. Gorch's disease, crumpled tissue paper appearance of cells. So, so look at this picture. Eccentric nucleus, along with that, you see the crumpled tissue paper appearance of the cells. This is Gorch's disease. Okay, next question is that whose deficiency is seen in case of Gorch's disease? What is deficient in case of Gorch's disease? What is deficient in case of Gorch's disease? Your answer is going to be glucocerebrosidase. Okay, glucocerebrosidase is deficient in Gorch's disease. These things are really important. So what you can do is, they're given very nicely in first aid. Okay, so be it uh, the lysosomal story diseases or the glycogen story diseases, they are given very nicely in first aid to the point and concise. So please read those pages from first aid for your family. They're going to help you a lot. So what you have to remember is okay, which substance is deficient, which substance is getting accumulated and ultimately which features would help you to differentiate between different lysosomal storage diseases. All right, moving on. Yes. So guys, if the question mentions the translocation 1418 over expression of BCL2, which cancer is this? Which malignancy is this? So, the cancer involving the translocation of uh, 1418, then overexpression of BCL2. Which cancer we are talking about here? The take home message is please read the table for translocations. They are very, very important. Please do that. Do not leave that. Okay. Excellent. Yes. So, you guys give the right answer. Smriti, Deji, Sachi. The answer is follicular lymphoma the answer to this question is follicular lymphoma okay so what you have to remember in follicular lymphoma is the waxing and the waning waxing and the waning course of painless painless lymphadenopathy painless lymphadenopathy so if the question mentions the waxing and waning painless lymphadenopathy, they are also pointing towards the follicular lymphoma. All right. Moving on. So please learn all the translocations, guys. Please do that. What is the toxic component in paracetamol poisoning? So can anyone answer this question? So supposing a child consumed the whole, uh, the, a lot of tablets of paracetamol. Okay. Now the parents have, uh, they are taking this child to the, uh, the emergency room and ultimately they report that this child has consumed a lot of tablets. Now which toxic component is responsible for creating problems in paracetamol poisoning patients? Excellent guys, the answer is NAPQI. Okay, NAPQI. So, NAPQI. So what is the full form of NAPQI? Can anyone tell? Full form of NAPQI. Yes, NAPQA stands for, anyone? So Sachi, this is not uh, N-acetylcysteine. I'm talking about the toxic components, okay? So the toxic component is N-acetyl, N-acetyl, yes, then para, para benzo, you know what I mean? 
and acetyl parabenzo you know what i mean okay so this is the toxic component and which uh, which is the antidote of choice in case of paracetamol poisoning so poisoning is also they are very important so what is the antidote of choice for paracetamol poisoning the answer to this question is going to be n acetyl cysteine n acetyl cysteine now guys remember n acetyl cysteine is a mucolytic also so there are different uses of n acetyl cysteine this is a mucolytic also okay then second it also prevents the contrast induced in nephropathy contrast induced in nephropathy so supposing someone has to undergo the contrast enhanced investigation for example contrast enhanced ct scan or mri okay and in this case you see that the patient is already having some kind of renal compromise but it is very important for that patient to undergo that so the this agent protects the uh the occurrence of this contrast induced in nephropathy so this is a nephroprotective agent and as cell cysteine know about it moving on monoclonal antibody against interleukin 6 monoclonal antibody against interleukin 6 what is the answer here can anyone tell the monoclonal antibody against interleukin 6 this is really important this this uh, drug has also been used in the past for the management of covid-19 excellent smriti the answer is tocilizumab okay the answer to this question is tocilizumab remember tocilizumab is used for the management of rheumatoid arthritis along with that this has also been used for the management of covid patients so supposing you are being asked in which condition would you give tocilizumab to a covid positive patient okay so the answer to this question is that if the patient is having moderate disease with progressive or you can say increasing requirement of oxygen and mechanically ventilated patients who are not you know improving despite of being given the steroids in this condition you going to try tocilizumab in the patients who are having covid 19 okay the covid uh, infection coronavirus now what is the most common anterior mediastinal mass can anyone answer this question what is the most common anterior mediastinal mass anyone priti this is not the most common anterior mediastinal mass okay gurjeet Deji, you gave the right answer. The answer to this question is thymoma. Thymoma. There are few points regarding thymoma which are very highly. Okay. So thymoma is the tumor of thymus gland. Thymoma is associated with a paraneoplastic syndrome. What is that? which paraneoplastic syndrome is associated with thymoma excellent gurjeet the answer is myasthenia gravis the answer to this question is myasthenia gravis okay now next question what type of auto antibody is seen in case of myasthenia gravis what type of auto antibody is seen in case of myasthenia gravis anyone in myasthenia gravis the antibodies are attacking the acetylcholine receptors okay so remember in myasthenia gravis the antibodies are attacking the acetylcholine receptors okay next question what is the differential diagnosis of myasthenia gravis so this is very very important you guys might be knowing it the differential diagnosis of myasthenia gravis what is that anyone the answer to this question is lambert eaton syndrome excellent lambert eaton next question in lambert eaton what type of antibody is seen in lambert eaton what type of antibodies are seen yes guys So the answer to this question is antibodies against 
वोल्टेज गेटेड वोल्टेज गेटेड कैल्शियम चैनल्स कैल्शियम चैनल्स तो गाइस इफ यू रिमेंबर दिस डायग्राम so here there is voltage gated calcium channel calcium channel as the wave of depolarization is coming what happens is these voltage gated calcium channels they open up what do we have in these the vesicles we have the neurotransmitter and here we are talking about the acetylcholine so acetylcholine is contained inside the synaptic vesicles as soon as a wave of depolarization comes here what happens is the voltage gated calcium channels open and as soon as the voltage gated calcium channels open calcium enters inside and at the very moment when calcium is entering inside the synaptic vesicles they are going to go towards the presynaptic membrane okay they are going to reach this presynaptic membrane now there is a role of very important substance that helps in the binding of these synaptic vesicles to the presynaptic membrane what is that that is known as snear protein that is known as snear protein okay once there is binding of these synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic membrane the release of content of the synaptic vesicles take place and as you know that acetylcholine is contained inside these synaptic vesicles acetylcholine will come in this acetylcholine will come in this synaptic cleft okay and ultimately acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptors and the action takes place now what happens in lambert eaton is the, the antibodies are attacking these channels calcium channels presynaptic voltage gated calcium channels so if these they are being attacked calcium won't be able to go inside so if calcium is not going inside the synaptic vesicles are not going to move towards the presynaptic membrane and ultimately the synaptic vesicles are not able to release their content in the synaptic cleft so this is the reason why acetylcholine is not there in case of lambert eaton but in case of the myasthenic rebus what happens these receptors for acetylcholine these are being attacked by the antibodies so acetylcholine is not able to bind to the receptors and ultimately action is not there okay so this is the reason why you compare both these situations next is lambert eaton is associated with which malignancy lambert eaton is associated with which type of malignancy what would you answer here your answer to this question is small cell carcinoma of the lung small cell carcinoma of the lung is the condition this is a malignancy which is associated with the maximum number of paraneoplastic syndromes so paraneoplastic syndromes this is also very high yield so please read about them okay so thymoma we talk about myasthenic gravis then small cell carcinoma we are talking about lambert eaton syndrome all right okay so that was all about today's session i hope you understood these important flashcards so tomorrow also we would be having a class in which i would be showing you very important high yield images right so we would be meeting at the same time i'll see you guys tomorrow and uh, you can go at with the courses of an academy my code is med student i'll see you guys tomorrow